Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is John Cutner. I am a partner with Weber Gallagher. I'm joined here by my partner, Penelope Camano. Uh, we are both in the North Jersey office, Warren office, soon to be Bernardsville, New Jersey office. Um, we are going to talk to you today about marijuana, medical and recreational, and the issues that have been arising for employers and insurance carriers as a result of the legalization over the last few years. Um, I have been talking on the topic uh, right through three or four years now, um, speaking on panels, etc. Um, so I have a bit of knowledge on it, um, and we're going to talk to you today specifically. I'm going to go over some of the legislative history on it, um, some of U.S. Polit political history on it, um, give you the state of uh, the federal legis law right now, state law, um, some issues on how it's impacting employers and insurance carriers, uh, some issues for workers' comp, and Penelope is then going to pick up and talk about a recent case that came down in New Jersey workers' comp this past December wherein a judge uh, ordered a carrier to pay for medical marijuana for the first time. Uh, so for, with that, I'm going to get started. Um, so prior to 1937, uh, from what I've read, marijuana was legal for medical treatment. Uh, doctors referred patients to for it. Uh, Physicians uh, were prescribing it for various ailments, and pharmacists were filling prescriptions. Um, in 1937, um, Congress passed what was called the Marijuana Tax Act, um, and that's interesting just in the name because apparently back in 1937, no one uh, referred to marijuana as marijuana. It was more widely known as cannabis. Uh, and it's said that they called it the Marijuana Tax Act because they didn't want a lot of opposition. Um, as it was being used as a medicine at the time, um, they didn't want to draw a lot of attention to the legislation, and it passed. Uh, despite opposition from the uh, American Medical Association, um, it went through. Um, and that, for all intents and purposes, put an end to the use by doctors of prescribing marijuana as a medicine. Um, also interesting is that it was also apparently backed by special interests, big business, industry, uh, that did not want to compete with marijuana and um, hemp as a competing commodity in the production of paper, etc. Big business, other big business was alcohol. That was where I probably lost you was um, from the Controlled Substance Act in 1970. Uh, marijuana was a banned substance, still is under federal law, um, which means um, it's completely illegal. There's been no ability for universities, researchers to get access to it, to do research on the drug, uh, to determine really effectively whether or not it is a medicine. Uh, it's kind of just been considered there's no medical use when they scheduled a Schedule I in 1970. Um, but moving forward, in 1996, California passed Proposition 215, which made it the first state in the country to legalize marijuana for medical use. Since that time, we have now 29 states that have legalized marijuana for medical use, including or not including Washington, D.C., which also has it legalized. Um, when I started talking about this subject about three years ago, I think the number of states was 20 states that had legalized it for medical use. And in three years, we now have almost 30. Um, and it's probably only going to rise from there. Um, we also have now seven states that have legalized it for recreational use. Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Alaska, California, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Washington, D.C. has it legalized for recreational use. So with that, we have this patchwork of states laws that have developed over the last 15 years or 20 years, um, legalizing marijuana for medical and recreational. Um, and that is in direct conflict with the federal law at this point. Um, that being said, um, in the last five to eight years, uh, the federal government has subtly changed their position on enforcement priorities for marijuana. Uh, more or less backing off of the enforcement of it. Um, 
Specifically, in August 2013, the um, Attorney uh, General put out a memo called the Cole Memo, um, and it was addressed to all the uh, U.S. attorneys around the country, and it prioritized, prioritized the enforcement of marijuana. And essentially what it did was, notably from the letter, it said, the existence of a strong and effective state regulatory system and an operations compliance with such a system may allay the threat of federal uh, enforcement priorities. So essentially saying, if you're operating under the state's laws, the federal government isn't going to get involved and uh, come down on you. Um, the only instances in which they would is if they found uh, some funny business going on, like uh, organized crime getting involved, uh, interstate commerce, traveling across state lines, but otherwise you're free to administer your laws as you want in these states. Uh, then in December 2014, Congress uh, defunded the DEA's budget to carry out raids on medical marijuana businesses operating legally under the state law. Um, so essentially taking the teeth away from the DEA and not allowing them to go after these marijuana businesses. Um, in December 2015, the DEA recommended to the FDA that it reclassify marijuana to a Schedule II drug um, under the Controlled Substance Act, and I suspect that that was the result of them uh, being defunded and essentially saying to the um, government, look, if you're not going to give us the funds to prosecute this, then change the law on, uh, under the CSA. Then in March 2015, uh, legislation was put forward by three prominent senators uh, on a bipartisan basis, Cory Booker from New Jersey, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York, and um, Rand Paul from Kentucky, uh, all helped to create what's called the CARES Act. Uh, this was the first kind of legislation on a federal level, which would uh, essentially end the federal ban on marijuana. Um, and what specifically it sought to do was reclassify marijuana from a Schedule One to a Schedule II drug. Uh, it would permit interstate commerce in specifically cannabidiol oils, not uh, the smokable leaf product. Um, it would allow banks to provide checking accounts and other financial services to marijuana dispensaries. Uh, it would allow veterans administrations, physicians to recommend medical marijuana to veterans. Um, Post-traumatic stress is apparently a condition that uh, there's a significant amount of literature on that marijuana is a beneficial treatment. Uh, New Jersey actually amended their marijuana legislation a couple years ago to include post-traumatic stress as a condition that you can qualify for it. Hmm. Um, it also would eliminate barriers to medical marijuana research. Um, so this is significant. Um, that being said, the legislation has languished in Congress and it has not come up for a vote. Uh, more recently, the DEA actually denied a bid just last year by due de two Democratic governors to reclassify marijuana from a Schedule I drug. Um, and the DEA has, however, loosened the restrictions on research. Um, this is important because essentially uh, at this point, as I said earlier, the federal legislation has not permitted any research. And you have all these states passing laws allowing it for medical purposes. That being said, there's really no data on the drug because there's been no research done because it hasn't been allowed. Uh, it's been so restrictive under the CSA that nobody's had the um, ability to gain access to the drug so they could do research on it. So I think this is a helpful step for everybody because we can get the research done, you can get data on it, and then the FDA can actually consider it at some point to determine where the, whether they'll approve it for certain uh, sicknesses. So now the all the states that have medical marijuana usage, the universities and colleges are allowed to conduct scientific studies on it to determine whether um, the addiction value and all that? Well, not, not because of the state laws, because federal law has loosened up a little bit to allow for it. 99% uh, of universities get federal funding, so they really have to consider the federal law rather okay. than the state law. Um, but because of these uh, loosening of the restrictions uh, by the federal law, they some of them have gained access and we're, you know, hopefully it's going to produce some results soon. Um, so, as I said earlier, you have this um, 
issue with the federal and the state law. We now have a new administration. Um, the president, the current president, President Trump, made some comments throughout the campaign, um, <clears throat> you know, stating that he wasn't opposed to medical marijuana um, and that he thought it should be left to the state. So those are encouraging if you're a proponent of medical marijuana. That being said, his attorney general is not a fan of marijuana, but <clears throat> my understanding and my feeling is, is that they will probably allow the states to administer their medical laws as they are currently. Um, if you happen to see me at the press this weekend, the uh, Department of Homeland Security chief was on it, and he was discussing the uh, issue of illegal drugs flowing into the country. And in that discussion, he was asked about marijuana, and he told the uh, interviewer that marijuana was not on their radar. It's not an enforcement priority for them. Cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine is their priorities, essentially saying that marijuana is really not a major concern because it's not killing people more or less. Um, I think the statistic he rattled off was 52,000 people last year died from one of those three drug, drugs I named. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's where we are on a federal level. We'll see what happens, but I don't anticipate that they're going to come down on medical marijuana, but we'll see. Um, so now moving on to issues that's create that have been created and are arising in the employment uh, arena. Um, how should employers address the issue of legal marijuana in their state? Uh, the general rule, I would say, is employers in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, can regulate an employee, employee's use of marijuana by prohibiting marijuana possession and use at work and prohibiting employees from reporting to work impaired or under the influence. Uh, a lot of employers uh, take the position and enforce the policy of zero tolerance. <clears throat> Um, if you are getting federal funding, you have to uh, abide by the Drug-Free Workplace Act. Um, private employers aren't required to abide by this, but most and many do. Um, now I'm going to skip so forward. That, so that means that people can't, not that they can, they, they can't use on the job. Correct. But what happens if they use before coming to work? Well, they, an employer is not going to want somebody on the job impaired, especially if they are in a safety sensitive position. So if you're smoking marijuana prior to coming to work, I don't know, but I anticipate you're going to be high for a while and you don't, employers don't want you showing up, <clears throat> putting at risk them and other employees on the job. The problem, and I'll get into it a little bit more, is the issue of testing and determining if somebody is intoxicated not reliable at this point. Correct. Um, so I'm going to skip one slide here. A few states, 11 specifically, have put into their into their medical marijuana statutes anti-discrimination provisions uh, for medical marijuana users, and this means that based on their um, being part of or being a medical marijuana recipient under their state's laws, you're not allowed to discriminate against them as an employer. Uh, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maine, Nevada, New York, Rhode Island, Arizona. Um, New York specifically, uh, I put an excerpt here, it says um, from their statute, shall any patient receiving marijuana shall be deemed to be having a disability under the state's human rights law. Um, so essentially what that's saying is if you're a recipient under the state law, you are part of that protected group now. Um, so if you're an employer in New York, you can't take adverse action on an employee based on their being part of this, being a medical marijuana recipient, or you'll be in violation of their rights under the statute. Um, similar to the Americans with the Disabilities Act, which does not have protections, though, for medical marijuana users um, because it's federally illegal. So you'll see on the bottom of this slide here, um, I have whether in an accommodation state or not, employers have to be careful to ensure that adverse employment decisions are made based on the employee's use of marijuana and not on the underlying con medical condition. Um, so that would be with respect to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal legislation. If you're in a state that has medical marijuana, they don't have a specific provision protecting the employees for marijuana use in that state, um, 
then you have to be, and you're going to take adverse action against an employee, uh, it has to be because of their use of marijuana. They don't have protections under the ADA for marijuana use. But you have to be careful not to be thought of taking adverse action because of their underlying condition, because then you could be considered to be taking, violating their rights under the ADA. Um, Arizona, Delaware, Minnesota, Nevada, employers cannot take adverse action based solely on the employer's participation in a medical marijuana program. That's similar to New York. Um, and now I'm going to back up to the slide before that. <clears throat> Interaction with state employment laws. Um, there's been a couple states that have their Supreme Courts have ruled specifically on uh, cases where an employee has brought a case for being fired uh, by the employer for being a medical marijuana recipient uh, in the most liberal states in the country, Colorado, um, California, Washington. Um, in Colorado, most notably, though, last year or two years ago, the Colorado Supreme Court came down with a ruling on the Co Brandon Coates versus Dish, Dish Network case. Um, and in that case, Mr. Coates was a uh, employee of the Dish Network. He worked in their call center, uh, clearly a non-sensitive, safety-sensitive position. He was fielding calls, um, I guess signing people up. He was quadriplegic again, and on a random drug test, he tested positive for marijuana. Um, the employer discussed it with him. He said that he was receiving it legally under the state's law. He had a card uh, that he did not get intoxicated prior to coming to work or at work. He did it on his own time, but because they had a no-tolerance policy, they terminated him. Mr. Coates then got an attorney and he filed suit. And he filed suit under what is the off-duty conduct law in Colorado, and a lot of states have these laws. Um, and specifically what the law says in relevant, relevant part is, it shall be a discriminatory or unfair employment practice for an employer to terminate the employment of an employee due to the employees engaging in lawful activity off the premises of the employer during non-working hours. So essentially it's these laws provide protections to employees from the employer getting involved in their private life for things that are lawful. Um, it happens in you know the age of uh, social media, Facebook, employers see that you're doing things online, they don't like, it reflects badly on them. Those are other issues, but with respect to marijuana, he brought it under this statute. Isn't, and, it, isn't it a fine line though, because you can suspect a person or know that someone's doing it off the premises, but how, if the testing is so difficult, how do you know whether it affects their work? Well, that's right. And their performance. That's one of the issues with marijuana is it's hard to determine if they are intoxicated or not on the job. So it makes it tough for employers to make a, take a definitive action right. without facing some type of repercussion. Right. Um, and until there's a test that is out there where we can act accurately determine if there's intoxication, it's going to be an issue. Uh, law enforcement has a big problem with it because these states are passing these laws and they're pulling people over and they don't know how to accurately determine if the person is intoxicated. Um, there are companies putting products out there. Um, some police forces are testing them out, but there's nothing out there that is uh, really found to be accurate yet. Um, so back to the Coates case, the Supreme Court of Colorado held in favor of the employer despite their uh, off-duty conduct law. And what they said was that the statute didn't specify whether it was lawful activity under state law or federal law. And because it's illegal under federal law, they found a way out and ruled in favor of the employer. Um, Mr. Coates was terminated. He couldn't get his job back. Um, New Jersey has no provision protecting the employee in their uh, medical marijuana statute. Um, there was a prop. Somebody did propose legislation to have an off-duty conduct law, but my understanding is that it's languished in Congress and it hasn't come up. Um, so now I'm specifically going to address New Jersey's Compassionate Use Act. Uh, it was passed in 2010 by then Governor Corzine signed into law. Um, Governor Christie shortly thereafter came into office and uh, Governor Christie was not a proponent of marijuana medically or recreationally. Um, it took a while to get up and running, but uh, it did eventually. Um, 
And New Jersey's statute is um, as different in terms of its restrictiveness um, from other states like California. Um, I mean, it's just drastically different. It's a lot more difficult in New Jersey to get medical marijuana. In California, you might be familiar, but in California, uh, it's virtually been recreationally free since 1996. Um, and that's because you can walk into a dispensary in California and they have a physician or a doctor in the dispensary who will write you a script right there on the spot and then you can get your script filled right there. In New Jersey, it's very restrictive. Um, specifically, you need to have one of a, a you know, a, a short list of in ailments or illnesses to qualify for it. And you'll see there on the slide, I have them listed. This is directly from the stat statute. Uh, they're serious uh, illnesses, seizure disorder, epilepsy, epilepsy glaucoma, uh, the following conditions if severe or chronic pain um, from severe nausea or vomiting or wasting syndrome resulting from HIV or AIDS, cancer, multiple sclerosis, terminal cancer, muscular dystrophy, um, and then terminal illness, if the physician has determined your prognosis uh, is less than 12 months of life to live. Um, so based on those, you'd think, how is this really going to come into play in workers' compensation? These aren't the types of things you see as a workers' comp claim, obviously. Um, but number five there is any other medical condition or its treatment that is approved by the department. And if you go on the department's website and you look at the um, form they have for you to fill out there, it has some literature. And essentially what they're saying is, is that you can apply for it and list a, a condition not listed specifically in the statute. And if we find that there's literature out there or anecdotal evidence that supports marijuana's use to treat that condition, we may approve it. Um, and so that's the way it's finding its way into workers' comp cases. That's how it found its way into the case Penelope is going to discuss with us. Uh, the petitioner had a neuropathic pain, and there's literature that it treats neuropathic pain well. Um, some of the other requirements under the New Jersey statute. Uh, you must have a doctor who is a registered doctor under the New Jersey law. Um, there's a list of doctors. If you want to be a doctor that's able to refer patients for marijuana, you have to be qualified and put on this registry. And in order to do that, you have to take a training course in their uh, administration of marijuana. Um, interesting that I don't think there's any requirement for that for opiate pain medication. Um, and I think that's interesting because it's such a problem in this state specifically in every other state in the country. Um, there probably should be. Um, the other requirement in New Jersey is that if you're going to get it from a doctor, you have to bo have a bona fide relationship with that doctor. Unlike in California, where you can simply walk into a dispensary and have a script filled after a simple evaluation for any number of problems that you're having. In New Jersey, you have to have an established relationship with the doctor. You can't just walk in to a walk-in center, get a script filled, and walk out and go get it. Um, in New Jersey, you're only allowed to get up to two ounces a month. Um, depending on your condition, they will tell you what you can get, but you can get the maximum you can get is two ounces a month. And from what I've read uh, in New Jersey at any of the dispensaries that they have, and there's six of them, the cost of an ounce of marijuana is between four and five hundred dollars. So you're really kind of looking at at the maximum paying maybe a thousand dollars a month or thereabouts. Um, the statute specifically provides that you cannot operate a vehicle, for that matter, heavy machinery. Um, you can only smoke in the privacy of your home. You can't smoke out in public. Um, it also states that uh, private health plans are not required to pay for medical marijuana. <clears throat> now, you might think, and some a judge that I uh, go before raised the issue to me, well, based on that, I wouldn't authorize it. But I think other judges are looking at it as uh, workers' comp isn't private health care. It's uh, social legislation enacted to protect the injured worker and that's how they will address that. Um, there are six distributors in New Jersey, two in the north, two in central Jersey, and two in south Jersey. <clears throat> so issues uh, that are raised in the workers' compensation arena as a result of legal, <clears throat> legal marijuana. 
safety, testing, and paying for marijuana. I'm going to cover two of these topics, and then Penelope is going to address paying for marijuana with the case that I uh, referred to earlier. Safety. <clears throat> um, I think this might be dating me a little bit, but <clears throat> I think this is what we're all worried about. Uh, Cheech and Chong in this picture, clearly not sure whether or not they're driving or they're parked. Um, marijuana is said to uh, impair cognition and uh, your ability to think and function. Uh, the effects on work performance, marijuana can impair cognition, balance coordination, decrease alertness, delayed reaction time, and on and on. Uh, so we really probably don't want people that are impaired smoking marijuana on our premises while working, especially if there is um, working in safety sensitive positions. They could injure themselves or others, obviously. Um, some of the statutes uh, throughout the country have safe harbor provisions, which essentially is a carve out in the statute specifically addressing safety sensitive work positions and that employers don't have to uh, hire people that are receiving marijuana. Um, New Jersey has the provision in there, not specifically with regard to work, but stating that you can't operate heavy machinery. Um, but it provides no protections from employees on the, using the drug. Uh, drug testing, we, tested, we touched on this already. Um, there's no test for intoxication for marijuana. The testing that can be done is to determine if it's in your system or if you've been using marijuana. Uh, that is a blood test, and from what I understand, marijuana under a blood test, uh, they can't determine when you smoked it, uh, which doesn't allow them to determine if you're intoxicated. So you could have smoked marijuana two weeks ago, three weeks ago, three days ago, and it's going to be in your system. This is a problem for trying to determine intoxication, as we discussed earlier. Um, so that's an issue. So unless you catch a person in the act or you know that they have the product on their person or in their locker or in their bag, then there's really no way for you to definitively know. No, I think the best way to do it is really, uh, you know, eyewitness accounts. If you have somebody, and this would just go to general policies in place for uh, workers' comp claims, somebody's injured on the job, you want to have thorough uh, initial investigation take statements from people who were there at the time, if the person was acting like they were intoxicated, okay. get those witness statements immediately. People's memories happen to you know, fall off after a period of time. They stop working for you, they leave employment. Uh, so anytime there's an injury, you wanna have a, a very good uh, procedure in place to take uh, initial investigation and get witness statements. And that's gonna be your best Defense. It's very interesting because in New Jersey, as you know, in an intoxication defense, it's but for the intoxication, uh, it's strictly liable. And if you have no way of determining, I know when, when people have these accidents and they conduct alcohol tests and blood tests, they can tell the person's intoxicated. Right. But with marijuana, you won't be able to tell. No, it's very difficult, which makes an already difficult standard that we have to achieve with our intoxication defense in New Jersey almost impossible with respect to marijuana. Um, I mean, it's difficult to get, you know, be successful on an intoxication defense in New Jersey with alcohol um, because it's the but four. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's our standard in New Jersey. Other states have much more reasonable standards, um, but that's where we are. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Penelope, um, and she's going to discuss this recent case that came down in December. Okay. Can you? Okay, great. Um, most recently, in the last few months, we had an unpublished decision that came down in the Division of Workers' Compensation in New Jersey, in which the judge ruled that a workers' compensation insurance carrier had to pay for medical marijuana. This is the first case of its kind in New Jersey, and um, although it's an unpublished decision, and we believe that it is foreseeable that a lot of judges in the future will be looking at the facts of the case and the reasoning of the judge behind it to make decisions as they come down the pike regarding medical marijuana in, um, in workers' compensation. In this case, the petitioner had a hand injury that had developed into uh, complex regional pain syndrome. He had received an award of 33 and one third percent of partial total. And in the order, as happens in a lot of orders, um, 
the petitioner was specifically designated to treat with a pain management physician regarding ongoing pain management. Um, in this case, the petitioner was taking, was having monthly prescriptions filled for ibuprofen, lidocaine patches, and 120 oxycodone tablets. As you know, oxycodone has it's like a hysteria out in the United States because a lot of people use oxycodone and it easily becomes addictive and it uh, turns people onto other types of drugs that are much more um, lethal. Um, in this instance, the petitioner, as he was continuing under authorized treatment with the pain management physician, had indicated to the pain management physician that he had experimented with the marijuana for the burning and swelling of his hand and had seen some positive results, particularly with the neuropathic pain. As this physician was not licensed person to the statute, he referred the petitioner to his partner who was licensed to dispense, um, to prescribe mar medical marijuana and they prescribed the medical marijuana. The petitioner started taking it and submitted the bills for payment to the insurance carrier. This was all done without the knowledge of the insurance carrier. They were not afforded the opportunity at any time to either accept or reject the, the prescription. And therefore, the matter was uh, filed, they denied the payment of the medical marijuana and an emergent motion for medical treatment was filed before the court. Um, okay. The issue at trial um, was whether the medical marijuana was curative or palliative. As you know, um, curative treatment is treatment that's going to make a person better, while palliative simply relieves the pain the person uh, suffers on a daily basis. Um, respondents have often taken the position, since it's in the statute and under uh, many cases, that respondents are not responsible for paying for palliative treatment, only curative treatment, although at times judges do enforce, uh, uh, do compel the respondents to pay for some palliative treatment. Um, in this case, the doctor, the authorized treatment physician, the pain management doctor, and the doctor who dispensed it refused to testify. And a third doctor was brought in by petitioner's counsel to testify on this issue. Um, and the doctor did testify profusely on the benefits of marijuana use versus that of opiate intake. He felt and provided the opinion to the court that the use of medical marijuana would reduce opiate intake, um, which is beneficial as opiate pain medication has numerous neg negative side effects. Um, the judge, after hearing the testimony, approved and ruled that the petitioner, that the respondent should pay for the medical marijuana and the petitioner could continue using it. Um, the basis for her ruling is that she felt that the effects of marijuana were not as debilitating as the Percocet. Um, also, what was brought into trial, and I think is vital, is that the pharmaceutical records showing the petitioner's intake of um, narcotic medication showed a reduction since he started using the medical marijuana. Um, this improved his level of functionality and in fact the petitioner had started working in the service industry and was able to better perform his job and go back to work. So we, we had the situation where the judge saw that the use of medical marijuana not only reduced the opiate intake but allowed the petitioner to return to work in a functioning capacity. Um, the issues that this case brings to light is that A, medical marijuana is still a Schedule One banned substance under federal law. Science does not substantiate marijuana as an effective treatment despite the opinions given by certain doctors regarding this issue. Um, most importantly, and I really feel that this was the reason behind the judge's opinion after reading the case, is that it lowered the petitioner's opiate intake, which can be a benefit for the employer because it can reduce the cost of um, the farm, it can reduce the pharmaceutical cost for the employer on a monthly basis. Um, in fact, you had mentioned to me that the reason the employer had not appealed this decision was that, in fact, they had um, it had been very cost effective. They had saved a lot of money um, because they were dishing out a lot of money on a monthly basis for the Percocet and the other opioid medication as opposed to the $1,000 cap mm -hmm. for the medical marijuana. Um, 
what the judge did talk about a lot is the fact that we have the right to direct treatment under the statute. Respondent, person to the workers' compensation statute, has the right to control medical treatment. And that is something that is very unique to New Jersey across the, uh, across the country. And that is how we basically are able to control the medical costs versus states like California and New York where the petitioners can treat endlessly right. and they have skyrocketing medical costs. However, the judge was very clear to state in her, in her decision that the right to control is not a pre-approval process. As you and I both know, we practice this regularly. We have motions for medical treatment. And um, sometimes judge, uh, a doctor can recommend some type of treatment. And we discuss with the doctor the reasons why we do not think it's warranted, causal relationship, and so forth. And the judge felt that when you have authorized a doctor to treat, that we should provide them with leeway to make their medical um, decisions. And as opposed to making decisions based on the commercial factor that they are in fact being paid regularly by the insurance carrier. And I feel that that's probably an issue that's going to be touched upon again and again. Yeah, I think the judge was, judges generally in workers' comp in New Jersey, when you have an authorized doctor treating someone and you don't like their opinion as here, the issue is a little bit more complex than that. But essentially, the doctor felt that the petitioner was going to benefit from medical marijuana. So he referred him over to his partner who was authorized to do it. Had he been, and he apparently had become authorized as this case went on, um, he would have done it himself, referred him for the marijuana himself. Um, Since this case, he has now become right. um, authorized, authorized to, prefer. to prefer. And more and more doctors, I believe, are, are obtaining um, the ability. Because it's becoming more accepted, um, probably more doctors will be be put on this list, but the judge was just displeased with the carriers, you know, second guessing the doctor's opinion, which they always are. Specifically, a quote from the judge in her opinion is, uh, here the court will not allow the respondent to deny, deny authorization of treatment which has now proven to be beneficial to the petitioner simply because the doctor did not allow for the respondent, did not allow the respondent an opportunity to second guess his medical opinion, which is exactly what you were saying. Uh, don't, you know, use pre-approval as a pretext to second guessing a doctor's opinion. And she also went on to say that although she was very cognizant, cognitive, cognizant of the fact that there was a lot of controversy regarding this issue, that it's legal in New Jersey to medically prescribe it, and therefore um, we must abide within the boundaries of the laws of this state. Um, what, I, what, what I see happening with this case is that some judges, as we've discussed, will approve the medical marijuana and some judges won't. But I think we should look further ahead on cases that are very catastrophic and cases where we are facing with people that are 100% totally disabled and um, they indicate that they can't go back to work, I do feel that a case-by-case -case analysis must be made. Um, we have some cases that perhaps where the petitioner is taking a plethora of opiates, perhaps medical marijuana could reduce the cost to the employer and it could increase the functional functionality to the person, especially in failed back syndrome cases, um, where perhaps then we could return a petitioner to work yeah. and not be responsible for paying 100% total disability for the rest of the petitioner's life. Um, I think employers, although in, uh, initially I think there will be uh, a pushback because you don't want to take this on, you don't want to be responsible for medical marijuana, there will be some ca certain cases where um, no medical, no, no medicine has worked and perhaps they were willing to engage and try this, this type of uh, treatment. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think what's appealing potentially for comp carriers is the potential benefit from the cost savings uh, aspect of it. Um, opiate pain medications, this guy was on 120 uh, oxycodones a month. Uh, when he started on them in 2012, the dosage, I believe, was 5 milligrams. It wasn't really relieving his pain significantly, and in 2013, the doctor upped it to 10 milligrams. So it was only increasing, which is decreasing his ability to function. Um, there's another case uh, from um, New Mexico, and the court, in the opinion there, it was an appellate division level case, wherein the court 
the appellate division in New Mexico has now ordered a carrier to pay for marijuana on two occasions. And the one case, they go into the fact that the petitioner was very withdrawn socially, he couldn't work, and after he started to substitute his, his opiates with the marijuana, he started to re-engage in life, essentially. Um, now that's according to the uh, testimony of the petitioner, of his wife. In this case, apparently it's the case as well. Um, this is dealing with RSD, and as employers know who have RSD cases, and we both know doing um, respondents' work, RSD is one of those conditions that you try all different types of treatment, including medically induced comas and so forth, and sometimes people just can't get into remission, and they go on with this constant pain, which can spread to other body parts. Right. So. And I, I think this is probably a treatment that you would consider in situations, as Penelope said, total cases or chronic pain cases where the person is probably going to be under pain management for the foreseeable future, you know, um, and potentially it's going to be opiates. And as we all know, opiates are a huge problem right now. I think, I don't know if I mentioned this, but when I started doing this discussion three years ago, the statistic at the time was 40 people a day were overdosing and dying from opiate pain medication, which is staggering. And today, um, the statistic has doubled. It's now 91 wow. people a day are dying. So this was obviously weighing on the judge that, uh, in this case, on her opinion, because she discussed those issues in her opinion, um, and the benefits that the petitioner received from marijuana. Uh, there are studies out there. The Journal of the American Medical Association did a study uh, three years ago, uh, or thereabouts, where they studied all 50 states um, and at the time, there was even less states with medical marijuana. And, but at that time, they did the study. It was over the course of 10 years. And they found in the states that had legalized marijuana, there was a significant decrease in opiate-related overdose deaths. Um, so they're finding that people are substituting and supplementing their opiate pain medication with marijuana. Marijuana is not as lethal, potentially, hence the... Um, Secretary of Homeland Security saying it's not on their enforcement priority. Um, so, you know, it's it's potentially in particular cases could be a benefit. Perhaps the respondents, although not embracing this, could possibly discuss this with their third party administrators and probably get someone on panel that they have probed, they have investigated, that would work with the carrier yeah. in certain instances where it is warranted. Yeah. By judicial by judicial ruling or, or whatever. Or, right. Or so and forth. certainly investigated as to, you know, it could be a cost saver. So um, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us after this. Um, we're happy to discuss it with you further. Thank you. Thanks.